Okay, thanks, Christian, for introducing me. My name is Bernard Kaiser. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, I apologize for the delay. I'm very sorry about that. We had a technical issue uh, when we tried to set up and had to do another uh, recording. So I hope everybody had the opportunity to join us. I thank you all for your interest for being here today. And uh, let's start right away with our uh, webinar of today. Uh, with a title going beyond functional safety, Sotif analysis of automotive systems. The structure, as you could see from the invitation is, first I'm giving you an update on the Sotif standardization. There was a lot of movement in the last couple of months. Then uh, another uh, update is I'm telling you about the inno in innovations in ANSYS Medini Analyze for Sotif. Uh, actually, from January 2020, with our version 2020 R1, we have for the first time integrated new modeling artifacts for SOTIF. And of course, we have some best practices, some ideas for you how to apply Medini Analyze for SOTIF. Then comes obviously a tool demonstration. I am giving you a very quick overview of some kind of SOTIF analysis that I prepared for you as a suggestion how you could tackle SOTIF in your organization. And at the very end, I give you a preview of the future integration with our simulation environment. And I will tell you why it is so important to further integrate safety analysis uh, and simulation when it comes to SOTIF. Yeah, the motivation I think is well known to you. Uh, the level of complexity that we are facing when moving to the higher levels of automated vehicles is unprecedented. I think even the moon landing that happened 50 years ago was not that complicated because the physical laws and the uh, objects to be encountered were more or less known. This is really something new, something challenging uh, for engineering science. And uh, it is a safety critical thing. Obviously, hazards are all around if you look at these pictures. So um, we have a couple of new challenges that are not sufficiently addressed by uh, functional safety as we have done it uh, for the last uh, 10 years or so with ISO 26262. One thing is uh, that uh, obviously the sensors, and I think an important category are camera sensors because the, the road traffic was originally designed for humans with human eyes. So the camera is one of the most uh, important sensors, but this applies to other sensors like radar and LIDAR as well. They suffer from both false positive rate, false negative rate. They can misclassify objects and so on. And uh, up to a, a lower level of automation, you still could refer to the safe side when you were unsure what it actually is. So if you have a brake assist system, and you have something that could be an object, but perhaps not, you rather don't break and rely on the driver. So the safe state is not to break in this case. Um, but this will change for uh, level four and five. If we have driverless cars or we allow the driver to do side tasks, then both decisions, whatever you decide could, go, could be wrong in terms of safety. There is no safe side anymore. So if you break without a reason, you could, provoke a rear collision, but if you fail to break on a, a real pedestrian, then you could kill the pedestrian. So whatever you do, it can be wrong. And this is a new challenge. So we simply have to rely on the availability and of the accuracy and the performance of our sensors, which is new for safety. Um, next thing is uh, that uh, misuse, misunderstanding in the human machine interactions, both between driver and car, but also between development engineers who design the use cases and scenarios and the actual world uh, in which the car is deployed can lead to a lot of uh, misunderstandings. The, the, the standard 21408 uh, always talks about misuse. Misuse is a harsh word. Often it's not misuse. It's just, yeah, the people have different concept of what we are doing. They are unsure who, who's taking control, what's going on. For example, this is a, a scene that actually happened during a, a, a test ride. Uh, this is a highway in Germany and it's a highway exit. And you see the curve of the road and behind there is a big sign saying Ausfahrt, which means exit, it's a metal sign. So, and the car of course uh, is still going at a high speed and directly approaching this sign. 
and the driver uh, tried to slow down, not to slow down to come to a stop in front of that uh, uh, metal sign, just to be slow enough to make the curve, so perhaps uh, uh, 80 kilometers per hour. And there was an autonomous braking uh, system in place, and the radar sensor well perceived that sign. I mean, you cannot overlook it as a radar sensor. Uh, so there was no problem with perception at all. And the software thought, okay, there's an obstacle in the middle of my way. The driver is braking, but the driver is not braking hard enough to come to a stop. So I will help the driver. And then the, the, the autonomous braking system engaged, although there was no reason to. So there was no, no fault. Everything worked as specified, but still it was uh, obviously not what you, uh, uh, intended to, to happen. So um, these are a new class of trouble that we uh, have not considered in the past in safety. Or um, then is the, the, the story about that uh, uh, convolutional neural network, all that AI algorithms for perception. This is, these are some pictures provided by Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, uh, you see in the upper row original pictures with a, a very good recognition here in the left picture, very high recognition of this tiny little pedestrian here. And then on the lower side, uh, depending on your screen resolution, perhaps you don't even see a difference at all. I see barely a difference, but there's a little haze uh, uh, added, and then uh, the uh, recognition rate goes very bad and you can say, yeah, but I have tested the system, but still it behaves different out in the road and we don't know why. So it was a main paradigm that we verify by testing and testing is representative. You test once and you, you have certainty forever. This is not the case. You, a little variation that you cannot even call by a name uh, can uh, make your verification invalid. And this is uh, certainly a lot of new challenges. So to summarize, what's new about the uh, 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 challenges of safety in the domain of automated vehicles. The traditional functional safety, as we used to know it from my 26, 26 too, is about hazard they are induced by failures. For example, a bug in the control software, a drift in an electronic part, a bit flip in a memory. But now we have a lot of new phenomena. The sensors and perception algorithms used in the automated vehicles have inherent limitations of their normal performance, even in absence of any failure. For example, the limitation of uh, object separation for a radar sensor, which has only a limited uh, spatial resolution, or a camera is bad at night. Everybody knows it. I mean, it's trivial. Um, these limitations can be further reduced due to the circumstances of the situations, like weather conditions, blinding light, flood of radar, echoes caused by a metal bridge. So, uh, for example, in, in heavy rain, the, the, yeah, the visibility of a camera can be even worse. Machine learning and other AI algorithms are hard to implement and verify according to the safety standards, so you cannot really put an ASL on it. Accidents of automated vehicles often cannot be tracked down to a single root cause, but are rather caused by a misfit of the environment and the assumptions under which the system was made, or by unfavorable chains of event. We are talking about systemic behavior or immersion behavior here. And of course, accidents. Uh, even of highly automated vehicles, even of driverless vehicles, can be caused by human machine misunderstanding. Because even a driverless vehicle is faced to other humans in traffic situations, and the people who design the systems are humans too, and can have uh, yeah suffered from misconceptions. So, for to cover these things that uh, were not sufficiently addressed by ISO 26262. Um, we have a new standard and we have a new term. The term is safety of the intended functionality, like it or not. Uh, uh, at least uh, the uh, acronym is easy to pronounce. It's called SOTIF, SOTIF is safety of the intended functionality. And the standard is the upcoming ISO 21448. So in the future, we still have obviously the FUSA, functional safety, according ISO 262. This will not become obsolete because uh, independent from performance questions, you can still have broken resistors or bugs in the software. Uh, but on top of this, in addition, as a complementary standard, you have the ISO PASS. At the moment, it's a PASS. PASS is for 
public available specification, so it's kind of a draft standard. But we have, uh, I will give you an update, we have the uh, 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 committee draft for the final standard now since uh, a month or so. So the, the, this standard ISO 21448, as it will be called in the end, addresses hazards that arise from unintended behavior of the failure-free system due to performance limitations, degradations or disturbances of sensors and algorithm, and it also covers hazards caused by failed human interaction or misunderstandings, ranging up to misuse. So the, the past version of it appeared already one year ago, or more than one year ago, what was targeted mainly for ADAS, not for automatic vehicles, so level one and two systems. But the work goes on and the work makes uh, great progress. So in December, I think it was, we saw the appearance of the committee draft for the final ISO 21448. And a lot of things have changed since then. Uh, and uh, uh, some smaller details may still change. We are in the commenting phase now. So if you look at it, so mainly, as I told you, the main difference between uh, FUSA in a classical sense and SOTIF is that one is uh, uh, dealing with uh, failures and the other with the uh, normal performance limitations. But if you look at the terminology, at the process model, at everything, uh, at first you may get confused. So why is it that much difference? On the left side, you see a B model, a kind of a linear model. On the right side, you see the cyclical models with one, two, three cycles, starting with a design analysis phase, then the verification phase, then the validation phase. Also, a lot of terminology is different. What is called HARA, or Hazard Analysis and Risk Assessment, in the 2626 tool, is called Hazard Identification in the 21448. Why, why does it have to be such different? Why do we have to reinvent the wheel? Do we have to have two different safety processes now? Um, well, for some terminology, there are really good reasons that I understand. In some cases, perhaps the people just wanted to be different. I don't know. Uh, uh, anyway, you should forget. You, you should not forget that these are just models. Even in the past, a V model has never been performed like this. Normally, you have a sequence of several Vs for iteration loops, or you have loopbacks, for example, to fix and correct loops when you test software. You had loops all the time. And also this here, of course, <coughs> is a sort of a linear model because in the end you want to get the, the product release, the accepted risk. So uh, if you put it in practice, it is not that different. You have to adapt and to apply to your own standards anyway. And the ISO 2626, no, the, sorry, ISO 21448 even encourages you in an annex, annex A, you have this figure of a V model. Uh, the V model is the classical process that you have for automotive spies for ISO 26262, and they have put a different SOTIF activities, five, six, seven, these are the numbers of the SOTIF chapters of 2148. They have put the uh, things on top of it. I mean, if it finally will look exactly like this, I don't know, but uh, at least uh, the standard is encouraging us to seek for an integrated common process that you need, and our tool, Makimi Analyze, is prepared for integrated analysis of both of these standards. And anyway, you will have to find your own way, make your tailoring, your adaptation. So uh, from all these standards, you will have to, to draw what is applicable, do some tailoring, depending on your type of project, on your role. Are you an OEM? Are you a supplier? Nobody does all of the process. What is your maximum safety level? What kind of automation level? What technologies like artificial intelligence are you using? You will certainly have your existing company processes on top of which you place all of this. And of course, for any kind of a, a product, for example, for radar, whatever, there is a state of practice, there are other domain specific standard. And you will have to mix all of this and to tailor all of this to your specific V model or cyclical model or HI model, whatever, and have a guideline so that the people don't have to work with the standard directly. And even on the project level, you will probably make more adaptations depending what project it is for which OEM, which technology, which ACL, and so on. This has been the case all the time when we were doing FUSA, and it will probably not change 
on which you will move. So it is. So don't be afraid to take these standards just as the toolbox from which you are drawing and make your own process that, of course, maps to the standard and fulfills the requirements of the standard. Um, in the standard, if you remember the initial cyclical model, there was not a lot of mentioning of analysis. There was, of course, initial hazard identification, and then we went just to the question, is there hazard already acceptable or not? Do we have to improve? That was all. And then we went to the two other cycles of verification and validation. So when that standard first appeared in the past level, it was not much mentioning of um, uh, analysis. Uh, just uh, a lot of verification, validation, test driving, perhaps some simulation, okay. Uh, of course, uh, I didn't like it uh, so much, first of all, because I am an analysis tool maker <laughs> and want to sell analysis tools, but uh, also I don't want the kind of a trial and error process. We had this 20 years ago in the classical safety world too, so we were uh, specifying, testing and preparing. Uh, but later we learned that it's perhaps a clever idea for us to do some causal analysis to understand what could go wrong before it actually does go wrong, because fixing problems early in development cycle is much more efficient than late when you find a problem during testing or even when the accident happens out in the world. So um, I even made a change proposal for that uh, process flow mentioning more analysis. This got rejected, but at least, as you can see in the standard annexes, and more than half of the standard consists of annexes, informative, of course, uh, you see a lot of mentioning here, identification via analysis, performance limitation to varying conditions analysis, analysis of specified behavior, specification analysis, ODD analysis. Uh, so there is a lot of analysis to do, and I think it absolutely makes sense, and we can even use traditional methods that we know already from other safety disciplines, like fall trees. There is even explicit recommendation to um, adapt uh, fall trees to, uh, uh, you call it, uh, yeah, uh, misbehavior trees or whatever, they're still debating over the name. And when I first introduced uh, almost one year ago fall trees in this, some people were criticizing me, ah, you know nothing of SOTIF, didn't you get it? It's not about fault, so why are you using fall trees? I mean, fall trees, it's just the name of this uh, technology. It's, uh, you can call it causal trees or deductive analysis trees, whatever. Um, so you can use it and also uh, the tabular inductive analysis types like FMEA, they are also Explicit, explicitly recommended. And I will, when we go to the tool part, show you how you can apply this in SOTIF projects. I did so in some pilot projects with customers. Here is an example. I don't want to go into the details because uh, it, is, it is from the standard. It's figure B3 from Annex B of the standard. But uh, not everything, honestly, is the way like I would recommend it. For example, they have the what I call the good cases, so that the, the vehicle breaks because there is an object. This is, I mean, this is okay. Uh, this is not even a problem in terms of SOTIF. Uh, uh, so I would probably not uh, uh, put this in, in a tree like this. I would certainly put in the general misbehavior, may it be USA related or maybe SOTIF related, but not the intended case. But this is a question of different style. I would not have these objects here but uh, deterioration due to sensor limitations. Uh, uh, this is very close, if you look at this left part, very close to what you will see in five minutes when I open the tool. Um, so we have a lot of analysis techniques that can work for both. You have to the left, the BUSA, to the right, the SOTIF. Uh, a lot of analysis techniques, hazard analysis, FTA, FMEA, HESOP, or you could more generally call it guide word analysis, and perhaps also the new analysis, which is becoming popular like STPA. They may work well for both for FUSA and for uh, uh, SOTIF. There are some things like the, the hardware failure matrix FMEDA, which is pure FUSA stuff. And certainly there is new type analysis, triggering condition analysis, limitation weakness analysis that has not existed before that we have to do for SOTIF. 
and I even recommend the term SOTIF concept. I think it appears once or twice in the standard. It is not really a, a, a chapter in the standard like we know it from ISO 26, 26 2, but we need to improve the system, obviously, when we find something, and this should be a kind of a concept. I just call it the SOTIF concept. So now, of course, uh, existing safety tools will have to be adapted uh, uh, for that new way of thinking. And uh, so first, let me start from this conception and malfunction or hazardous behavior, as you could call it. Some people don't like the term malfunctioning. Although if you open ISO 262 uh, and look up malfunction behavior, you will find it is uh, unintended behavior or failure. So it can be both. So the definition would fit. In Medini, we will also we will be using the malfunction model object for this, but we could just call it hazardous behavior to be compliant. Anyway, uh, what is new is that it is not just raised down to one particular failure, but it's often a combination of a triggering condition in the environment. At the beginning, you may have a lot of unknown triggering conditions, but the process of SOTIF means you want to uncover them, you want to make them known. And this combines to the weaknesses and limitations. For example, weakness of camera is that it is bad when the light is low. Of course, in sunlight, this is no problem at all. You will not have any misbehavior. But it combined with the triggering condition that it's night and there are no street lights whatsoever, then it may lead to overlook, which is a hazardous or malfunction behavior. And we offer to yeah, apply this to a fall tree. And here's the end gate. So this is the original screenshot from Medini. You may, if you are familiar with Medini, discover new symbols here, like this one or this one. This means triggering conditions. So this means weakness or limitation. And this is new. We have improved, uh, augmented our data model in Medini. We can now have triggering conditions. We can have weaknesses like susceptibility to metal echoes for a radar or reduced contrast resolution at poor light conditions for a camera. And we have the triggering conditions like uh, object has similar color as background, object is moving too fast, the light is low, heavy rain, whatever. We can put them into collections for the triggering conditions because the triggering conditions always come from outside. They are not related to any model element. For the weaknesses, we have two options. We can also put them into collections in Medini, like for malfunctions or failure modes, but we can also directly attach them to the object. So I can say, this is the camera, and like the camera may have some failures, the camera also has some weaknesses that are not failures. So I can model like uh, it worked in the past. So if you're familiar with Medini, if you are a Medini user, you will certainly find it easy. Um, so this is the new semantics. If you have a sensor like from camera, function could be detect objects, malfunction could be weak detection. And then we can have these uh, uh, limitations either as direct limitations that are bound to the camera, like uh, 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 irritating reflection, whatever that affects the whole camera. Or you can use the characteristics that we had in Medini before even. Uh, to say this is the nominal performance, the normal range of your normal field of your normal contrast resolution, because even this is not infinitely good, uh, it is somehow limited. And then you can attach additional limitations to these characteristics, like the nominal range of uh, uh, view can be further reduced, uh, for example, by external causes, triggering conditions like fog or rain or bad light conditions. Uh, this is the way how you can model in Medini now. Um, you can put the things into uh, um, collections, and I, as I will show, if a, a trigger and condition is something that needs more explanation, for example, driving out of a tunnel or being overtaken by another car that suddenly breaks after overtaking me, I can link to more detailed modeling uh, or in activity diagrams, and you may guess it, once I have it in activity diagrams, this is the ideal starting point to feed this in any kind of test case or simulation. Uh, of course, Medini will not be a simulation tool at any time, but you can model what is important to the safety analyst and then export it to uh, a safety, uh, sorry, for a simul to simulation tool that then is used to, to add more details and do parameter verification uh, variation to run the uh, simulation and test case then. 
this example of a four dream. Uh, what I like a lot is, uh, is the separation functional level, technical level, and I found out that on the functional level, you can perfectly use the same fault tree for associative and FUSA related problems. You don't even ask for the cause, you just notice, yeah, there is a weak detection or there is a ghost object, and the, the question why comes later when you link here to the technical level, and if a uh, 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 perception system fails to detect a vulnerable road user, a VRU, then it can be either for uh, limitation, performer limitation reasons, or to, for failure reasons. And then you come to the technical level, technical analy analysis level, technical safety concept level, and then you can still branch into two different subtrees that come here under these transfer symbols. One of them uh, is the associative one, so fail to detect, detect a VRU can uh, be a false negative or weak detection, false negative can be a combination of the triggering event of an unusual pose of a pedestrian in combination with the inability to detect objects of, or poses of objects that have not been trained if it is a neural network. And you can either go, e, even go one step further down and you will find out perhaps an error in your process. The training of your neural network was not representative enough, so you need to improve it. You have to derive a requirement, make it better next time. And the other fault tree is a classical one. I don't want to go into details, uh, just three examples. Failure could be data corruption, bus interruption, or here another kind of human error, a software implementation bug. In the frozen hardware part, there are thousands of combinations, but I'm not talking about this today. I'm talking about the left part of the SOTIF. Okay, and as I said, if you have a triggering condition, like I call it cut in and break, if you are familiar, by the way, with the um, automatic driving verification and the open scenario standard, it was one of the default scenario that is shipped with an open scenario, cut in and break, or in German we say, na, ein Scherer, <laughs> you cannot really translate this to English, sorry. Uh, and we can use the available modeling element, static modeling element, and uh, activity diagram modeling elements that are already there, that's not even new in Medini, to attach a more differentiated modeling to this object by a trace. And then it may look like this. What I did here, you may be, um, surprised by these nice little symbols. Actually, it is just an activity diagram, but Medini gives you the possibility to replace any kind of an object uh, uh, by uh, improved or more fitting uh, um, diagram or, uh, or a thumbnail. You can have a, a JPEG or a GIF or whatever image. And I just took some images I found on the internet that shows and it exemplifies the scene I'm talking about. What you also can see, I use the annotation for some kind of semi-formal language, driving with the speed above 100 but below 120 kilometer is the initial scene. Then there happens an event. Car 2, the red one, appears on lane 2, 500 meters behind. Perhaps it is the, the horizon of my sensors. And then it's uh, overtaking me, it's merging in, driving in front of me, and finally, shortly after, uh, the other car is braking, and it's important that the duration here is limited because if the other car starts to brake after 10 minutes, I don't care, but if it happens after one second, then perhaps my uh, tracking algorithms, my Kalman filters were not fast enough to adapt, and I will not be able to avoid the rear collision then. So these are typical cases of a more complex triggering condition, and as you can see, uh, with this kind of a formal language, we are already in the middle of working how to export this stuff from Medini into a, a simulation tool chain, which will uh, most probably happen with a upcoming Open Scenario 2 file format that will then be natively available, but not this year. Um, okay, enough talking. Let me go to Medini uh, tool demo. I have explained lots of the concepts. Let's briefly rush through uh, a demo project I prepared, obviously, because I cannot do this all of this in real time. Uh, this is my SOTIF pro uh, uh, process here, highway pilots, example of a highway pilot, so a system that 
takes over the lateral and the longitudinal control, but only in restricted areas on a highway. The driver is allowed to do side tasks, but not be, must be able to take back control of steering wheel and brake pedal within a couple of seconds when prompted. So, so let's start with the uh, uh, first thing yeah. with task list. Perhaps you are familiar with Medini task lists. Uh, uh, task lists help you structuring the process. So uh, the standard, as I said, is just a rough guideline. You will have to find your way of working, make a guideline, and a task list is a way of making a guideline. We will probably soon ship a best practice template for SOTIF with a task list template in. Uh, I don't get to all of the points, take too much time. Uh, um, just here, you start with some generic tasks, specifying setting up the project, define a collaboration with OEM or supplier, depending on what you are. Doing. So this is in CIA, development interface agreement. Then the specify the item, which is the item definition. And you can see here, I wrote ISO 26262 plus 21448. So I absolutely see no need to do two separate things. You can do the same thing. Of course, there are some more specific things that you wouldn't do for ISO 26262. For example, define the ODD. Uh, there are other things like list assumptions, list uh, legal requirements, uh, verbal description, overview architecture that you ha would have to do anyway. You can do so, though the checklist, if you are not familiar, takes you directly to the artifact. You can say, show in the browser, and then you can say, uh, open it for me. You can see here the verbal description. What is the highway pilot? I explained already, so I am not going into details. Uh, uh, some other fields. And what is perhaps interesting to notice, uh, using the profiling mechanism. So profiling means I can add new text attributes in Medini. I made one field for ODD definition. So it's allowed to operate only in motorways with mechanical separation, which means guardrails between the two directions of traffic. No pedestrians and cyclists allowed. No crossroads, no traffic lights. So uh, this is an easy way of doing it. What is if you have a more complicated system and the ODD is not just one sentence or two sentences, it's a list of numbered items. Of course, you can use any other Medini data object that's provided like a checklist or requirement set to specify the properties of your ODD and put in a link to your item definition. That's also uh, possible. So um, then after, uh, after the item definition, uh, perhaps I give you a first uh, view on the architecture at this time, because it is certainly interesting what I'm talking about. I'm going directly in the functional, in functional level architecture that I'm using for uh, my for, uh, discussion and analysis too. Yeah, just as a simplified uh, uh, system, we have to the left uh, sensors, as representatives for the sensors, I choose a camera, a LiDAR, and a radar, all front-looking, and I just put in a command placeholder for other kinds of sensors that may exist in reality. I have a sensor fusion that generates an object list and a distance to objects to break for. Uh, also, we have road type and traffic sign recognition that tell me if I'm inside or outside of my ODD, which is supported also by self-localization by HD roadmap and uh, GPS or other kind of localization. Uh, so this all goes to this block of the enable sensing that triggers the state manager that makes the hand over to the human. The object list and the road uh, delimiters, whatever I need to navigate, goes to the track planner, which is combined of the lateral control, so lane centering control, and the longitudinal control. And it's pretty much like an adaptive cruise control with an emergency braking function, which then feeds into an arbitration block. There is, of course, eagle motion sending, sensing the speed, the acceleration, yaw rate, and not to forget the HMI elements, which are very important for our investigation of human errors, uh, uh, misunderstandings and everything. And on the right side, we have the usual, oops, the usual, uh, um, yeah, actuators, power drain, brake, steering, and uh, side signaling, light turn signal, and of course, again, HMI. At this point, again, we will probably have to investigate with keyword-based analysis what could go wrong. Is the message clear to everybody? What is if the driver is sleeping when he gets a prompt to, to take over? Whatever stuff. 
Um, yeah, uh, so this was an item definition. After item definition uh, comes uh, uh, the HARA. And also here, I say that uh, the initial HARA can be pretty much the same for IC 26, 26, 2, and 21, 4, 4, 8. Why am I saying initial? Because there is still a difference. In, in the regular FUSA, the HARA is something you do at the beginning. And then you have everything, safety goals and ASO. You review the HARA, you seal the HARA, you put it uh, in your safe and uh, it, it, it's finished. In the, in the SOTIF, probably the HARA will be a kind of a living document, getting more and more complex, covering more and more situations and behavior that you will discover while performing your validation. So this is something that may change. Also the question with ASO, without ASO. Of course, if you are using it for both, you will probably have uh, ASO. Um, this is uh, all possible. So I'm giving you just a little example of a HARA. Um, the normal HARA, I'm starting with a function like distance control or emergency braking. I'm starting with some selected malfunctioning behaviors. So not adapting to speed is a behavior, misbehavior of distance control, unjustified strong braking is a misbehavior of emergency braking. I have the hazard names like collision or too short distance, or unjustified strong braking, potential effects with their severity and controllability. I mean, severity and controllability you need in SOTIF as well. They are mentioned in the standard to see perhaps if it's S0 or C0, then it is acceptable from the beginning. You don't have to do something. Um, then, of course, we can derive safety goals. Safety goals are not really mentioned. Uh, in the SOTIF, but I think it's useful to have them. And uh, what I also have is here, this is uh, my personal uh, additions. I have modeled uh, using uh, um, actions, and this is my language, the expected action. It helps you to figure out what is the wrong behavior. So if you say the expected action is to break or to keep the distance or just continue driving, then you can rather easier find out uh, what is the malfunctioning behavior. And we have a little bit about traffic situation. Uh, you are familiar with all of this. And as usual in Medini, oh, sorry, I need to figure out the control bars here. Uh, as usual in Medini, you uh, have from the safety goals, the full navigability. You can say show in browser, it takes you there. You can click it, it takes you in the diagram and you can step by step decompose it into a safety concept. This is one of the strengths of Medini that uh, you are not just listing a long row of uh, safety requirements. I need this, I need that, I need a motion stop, I need a watchdog, I need an end to end. But you can go down step by step uh, how you negate the failures that you found on every level, how you can prove that these three things together fulfill this and all these things together fulfill the safety goal. So building up a structured safety case, a structured argument is one of the strengths of Medini. So one of the things prevent unjustified strong braking hazard is of course prevent that non-existing objects are reported at all or that prevent that objects are reported collision critical if they are actually not. And this breaks down to these requirements uh, detect or prevent ghost objects. And you can see there are a lot of requirements that uh, start with detect or prevent, detect or prevent. So you can figure out why they have been automatically created. You can in Medini derive requirements directly from fault tree events. And then uh, they just negate the fault tree events and you just have to connect them in this diagram. But this is what we want to do later. So first, what I usually do, and I have been doing this for FUSA, I keep doing it for SOTIF as well, is I'm starting with a fault tree. And in the functional level, uh, I see not even a necessity to do a separate fault tree for SOTIF and FUSA. Of course, you can if you want. But I think it's not even necessary, as I told you before. Uh, I think it's sufficient to branch into the two disciplines when you come to the technical level because then you know what is the cause for the problem. Is it technical failure, is it an insufficiency? On the functional level, you just describe what's happening. So safety goal one violated means unjustified braking by highway pilot. Um, so it could be caused by detection of a non-existent uh, uh, object or wrong positioning or, or classification of an object. And um, you can this 
directly linked to malfunctions that you have assigned to your sensor. So in this, you can see by the red malfunction system is a real data object. I can say related object represents and voila, I'm here in my perception subsystem in the function detect and track objects in front and the malfunction is ghost object or neglectable object reported. And so it works. I can use uh, Fortree as a deductive analysis and later branch. Let me show you another example where I can show how this branching works uh, for safety go to, which is the opposite. This first one was unjustified breaking. Second one is the opposite thing. It is uh, missing or insufficient breaking when there is actually somebody in front of our car. So it's the opposite thing. So I can also break down the vulnerable road user, like a pedestrian was not detected at all, or at the wrong localization, or it was detected, he was detected, but missing or delayed in OT break request, or it was a problem with the braking system itself. Here I'm delegating, you see this symbol here means undeveloped event, I'm delegating to the brake system manufacturer. Most of this will not be performance related, but FUSA related at all. And even if it's performance related, uh, then I think we have existing processes in place for mechatronic braking systems. I don't have to care as a full associative engineer. But here for not detected, you can see I do a further breakdown, detect and track objects in front uh, and the uh, malfunction is existing objects in the field of view is not reported. And here I made a split into uh, technical failures and insufficiency by failure, by limitation or insufficiency. If I double click here, it takes me to a FUSA fault tree, which is the couple of arbitrary examples I put in to show you like failure in the processing hardware, message loss on the bus, data corruption, general software bug. Don't need to talk about this. Much more interesting is the other half of it. If I double click here, uh, it takes me uh, to a fault tree, uh, existing object not reported uh, due to performance limitation. And I put already a couple of combinations in uh, and you see here I prepared an empty AND gate to show you how it is intended to work with the limitations uh, and the triggering conditions. For example, you could say it's a limitation of my camera um, that it is uh, has a, a uh, reduced resolution in poor light. So um, um, here uh, resolution in dark areas. Uh, and then we can uh, find, for example, a triggering condition like dim light or low contrast, which is particular to this situation. For example, here, object similar color as background, I can put this together, which reads as uh, the, the contrast resolution is uh, uh, poor in dark areas. And when then an object comes with a similar color as the background, this together leads to an existing object is not reported or has just a weak detection, is not sufficiently qualified, and therefore I'm not breaking, and therefore I'm hitting this pedestrian. This is usage of fault trees, which is explicitly recommended in, in the FUSA. Of course, we still have the, what was used uh, to be called a, a failure net. We now call it a causal net because it's not just failure uh, anymore. So we have the cause effect net. Uh, and you can go down here from the hazard unjustified strong breaking. It's also the uh, same name of a top level uh, malfunction. Uh, one of the causes ghost object reported and um, uh, uh, the causes are susceptibility of the radar this time to metal reflections in combination with the triggering condition of metal object, for example, bridge or guardrails are in the scene. So, and these are all real objects. So if I, if I use a FMEA style analysis, which perfect fit for this and attach the causes and effects and it will automatically show up here in the causal net as well. I can always navigate and trail and say, uh, 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 show this, uh, show the causes, show the effects, uh, uh, focus on this here in the model browser. Here you got it. Uh, it's all closed. So 
now to finish up the analysis part, let me very briefly show you how you can do analysis for human machine uh, uh, misunderstandings by or by uh, or, uh, how to find limitations. Let's start here perhaps with a limitation analysis. Um, I was using the, formerly we called it the HACCP, now we call it a just guide word analysis, we call this a multi-purpose analysis. We have here the front camera as a type, we call it affects all such cameras and the characteristics, normal range of view, normal field of view, normal contrast resolution, light sensitivity. And I have prepared a, a checklist, a checklist template, which is inspired by uh, a, a checklist you defined in an annex uh, of ISO 21448. And you have certain keywords like climate that subdivides to cloudy, light rain, heavy light, fog, and so on, snow. Then we have road features like tunnel, underpass, bridges, and so on, uh, uh, light conditions. And I use this to systematically derive the weaknesses. So at night, there is a risk of blinding. There is a risk of irritating reflections. The contrast resolution is reduced uh, at night. Uh, uh, the sensitivity uh, is reduced to uh, may lead to overlooking dark objects under poor light conditions, reduced cork resolution at night. So this is help you to systematically find out of the weaknesses. You can use a similar analysis for triggering uh, conditions as well. You can start triggering conditions analysis if you know uh, what were the problems, what were the uh, properties of the object. But you can also, and I will very briefly summarize this in, at the end of my presentation, import triggering conditions that you have uh, found by simulation or by test rides. You can directly couple tools like Skate Vision uh, that helps you find out triggering conditions because it will probably be too hard for a safety analyst to find out about all these things. There has to be closer cooperation. Okay, uh, looking at the time, we started a little late, unfortunately. I will probably skip more details here in tools. Of course, as always, you can derive uh, uh, um, requirements uh, here, uh, derive requirement from a malfunction, get a requirement uh, that you can place in some module. You can arrange the requirements in that tree structure to build up your safety argument. You can view the same requirements also in, um, in a tabular editor for requirements. Is any this one perhaps, yes. Uh, you can have all the requirements that have been generated in their structure in a format. You can see it that can easily be exported to any kind of requirement system, DOORS, Next Generation, JAMA, PTC Integrity. Um, you can, uh, of course, formulate more closely. So usually in the diagram, you just have a short name, detect via rules in critical range. And here uh, you have the full version, all via use. Uh, uh, shall be detected quickly enough to allow for emergency braking. Read the parameters quickly enough means 200 milliseconds time constraint. You can put an ACL, you can put a status. All of this, you can export it and you can create tasks from it and link these tasks to any kind of a system like JIRA. You can create from a requirements implementation tasks. You can create verification tasks uh, that takes you in the verification loop. All of this is possible. You can, of course, use specification or a, a requirement like artifacts also for your validation verification duties that then go to the simulation tools or the test drivers. All is possible in Medini. In some cases, however, you may want to delegate this to uh, another more dedicated planner. Okay, this was a brief overview on Medini, what we have to offer. Certainly, there's much more to show and to discuss. We can make trainings and discovery if you are interested in implementing Medini. Let me finish the last uh, uh, yeah, 10 minutes, probably, because it started late, with a, a preview on what is further on our roadmap. Further integration with our simulation environment is on the way because uh, in traditional FUSA, the safety engineer could do the job mainly separated from the testers and the developers. 
all the failure modes were known. Sometimes you need a domain expert for your HARA, FMBA, okay, but the rest you can do on your own. You have your interaction points, you can import the architecture, export your requirements, you know the typical call and use scenarios, you know the typical failure mode, you know if the transistor can have open circuit, short circuit, drift, so why, why need to talk with uh, the, the specialists? And you can just rely on best practice, you can say to a software engineer, hey, you have to do MCDC coverage because it's ACLD and that guy knows what to do. You don't have really to collaborate with the testers as a safety engineer. This probably will change. The, the behavior of some perception algorithms can be so unpredictable that analytical techniques alone may not discover malfunctions. We had really uh, uh, the case that uh, an algorithm was good in detecting pedestrians, but a road worker with a yellow reflecting warning vest that normally you would say improves visibility, this road worker was not reported as a pedestrian. Probably the training uh, of the neural network had a gap here. How can you find this just by thinking about it? It's impossible. You need to try it out. You need to simulate. You need to, to test drive. Even the sort of analyst thinks about a problem cause like dim light and dark object. So even if he or she thinks about it, you probably don't know the determining parameters. Without simulation or test, you don't know how dark, which colors are a problem. Uh, you will have to verify this because uh, otherwise you will just declare everybody that exists as potentially hazardous. And this is also not a solution. Then even if you find a problem, then the causal chains are often obscure. When you take simulative exploration or problem injection, uh, to explain. So if an uh, object is not reported, was it because the camera did not see him or the radar did not see him or both, or was it a problem in the fusion? You have to find out, otherwise you will not be able to improve your system. And the safety engineers will have to specify what exactly to verify. I guess there will be much more verification duties coming directly from the discipline of SOTIP than we had for SUSA in the past. But the safety engineers cannot go as deeply in detail, so they, there needs to be a handover to the simulation engineers that uh, uh, make the simulation setup that adds the missing details and then run the simulation and report back to the safety analyst. Here's an uh, example of our simulation tool we are experience. In order to simpler simulation tools, can simulate effects like glaring sun or haze or rain effects, whatever, physically accurate. So you can find out that this is a problem and can then uh, add it to your list of triggering conditions in Nagini. In the best case, you have an automated import of a tabular style so you get all the uh, uh, things into Nagini Analyze. In SOTIF, you will probably never guess all possible triggering conditions by analysis alone, even if you're an experienced specialist. You need to work with simulation and with testing. Also, if you have uh, uh, detection problems, like here in a real test ride video that can obviously detect it with skate vision, but also in our open loop sensor simulation or closed loop driving simulation, of course, you must make sure that the triggering conditions the malfunctions like weak detection or misclassification, and also the resulting hazards, if any, uh, will be imported back in a systematic manner into Medini. And of course, we will work with you to provide you means to do so import facilities. Uh, for but then I want to point out that our tools, Kate Vision, that I was not able to present in this short time today, there are other webinars on that, helps you to automatically uh, discover uh, problematic cases in masses of collected road data and reduces to the interesting scenarios that go then in a triggering condition scenario database that you can exploit in Medini and can use it directly as a triggering condition collection. We have already implemented this prototypically. If you're interested, please uh, um, yeah, uh, give me a call or email and we can show this uh, in a, on, on a basis is not yet uh, publicly released. Um, here, for example, we have things you can find out by skate vision, and you can manually label potential reasons why this pedestrian and this and this have not been detected uh, while you were driving. 
And you will find out there are several reasons, but there is one common thing, which is the low contrast. In all of the three cases, you have low contrast. So wouldn't it be reasonable to assume that there is a causal relation between low contrast and weak detection? Of course, this is not a proof, but uh, it is, it gives you a hint to analyze more to find out if there is a systematic problem and then to improve the system to get rid of this systematic problem. So uh, we have already, as I said, a prototype to get these things in Medini and to make cause effect relation. And you can see what are the frequent cause effect relation or the first of all the frequent coincidences that then point you to a potential cause effect relation. Uh, and what are just exceptional things that you probably don't have to investigate any further. And then like this, you get these things. So uh, this is all stuff that has been found by skate vision, blur, uh, dark color, as triggering conditions. You see it, the triggering condition symbol in Medini. And the effect is then, uh, the immediate malfunction is then weak detection or duplicate detection or misdetection of a car, of a truck, whatever. Here you can see after import the scene, uh, the, uh, the frame number and the video file. And here you can link to the effects on vehicle level, like too low distance or even crashing into another vehicle. And these are all created by importing from skate vision. Of course, the effect is something that the Sotif analyst has to do manually. This is the job you do in Medina. And then you can look at it as a table. You can look at it as a causal net, cause effect net that automatically uh, populates and leads from the sensor weakness up to the hazard on vehicle level makes the connection. Last but not least, we have the way from Medini also to uh, uh, the simulation. So if you say as a safety analyst in Medini, I'm afraid that a close merge into my own lane by another vehicle could be detected too late. Could you please check out this for me? I'm not sure if it's critical and under which conditions. I'll have to import a scenario stop as I call it, so under specified scenario. Uh, that goes to a scenario generator. We have such tools in place. This is outside of Medini, by the way. And the format will probably be in the future open scenario too. And I have to uh, export also the monitoring conditions I'm interested in. For example, if two vehicles get closer to each other than five meters, or if I'm getting closer than allowed to a pedestrian, or braking stronger than a certain deceleration, then it's hazardous, then I want to, go, to get a this goes in a scenario generator that makes hundreds or even thousands of scenarios that then run on our uh, simulation uh, tool chain with your experience with driving simulator and closed loop. And whenever uh, evaluation monitor uh, is violated, so we are actually getting too close, then I want to get back a uh, uh, log report, which is a, a sort of an Excel style table with a malfunction, with a scene number, when it happens, what were the parameters I chose, what were other site conditions, and I can import into Medini and then discuss uh, with a safety specialist what could be the reason, what could we improve, improve about the system. So this makes the link between simulation world and the safety analysis world. This is uh, just a, a, a short view of our uh, tool chain for closed loop simulation. You see here, photorealistic. We have separate uh, webinars on our uh, simulation tools, on uh, your experience, and also the skate vision uh, if, you, if you are interested. Overall, ANSYS has a complete tool chain for uh, automated system specification, architecture building with Autotile here in Skate Architect safety compliant code generation and uh, dashboard generation with skate suite and skate display, the safety and SOTIF analysis in Medini analyze, the model in the loop, process on the loop testing, sensor perception, open loop simulation, and then of course, closed loop validation of the whole vehicle. And Medini for SOTIF plays an important uh, central part in this overall scenario of making uh, automated vehicles safe and reliable.